So I'm Rebecca Hampel, and I'm uh, currently on hiatus from uh, 11, I've been working 11 years training and working 11 years as a uh, healthcare chaplain specializing in palliative care. So that also most recently has been in hospice, but definitely in critical care and in the hospital system. And that was a calling that emerged while I was doing a, a second career, a third career, at the University of New Mexico and playing cello with the arts in medicine program and also being a member of Hope in the Desert at the time mission of the diocese and uh, quite involved then with the music ministry but also in, in its healing prayer ministry which uh, God called me into from no, no understanding except a, a breast lump that spontaneously disappeared through after a, an important session with a very good counselor who was of Jewish and uh, Jewish back um, background, um, but very very ecumenical, broadly ecumenical, with a deep ecumenism, and so overnight, my my breast lump was discovered by my my uh, physician. So that was, and then it took a couple of weeks for it to me to get in, and it was gone after a deep spiritual ex cathartic experience so i was interested in that and at the time saint marks in the mesa was very very spirit-led um it, or had a uh, an associate pastor who was very spirit-led they met kathy uh at the time her name was kathy newman i think anyway um she I didn't know her. I sat in the back pews of that church with my infant and when he was in the daycare and wept because of my um, my divorce. And so what had happened was I had not processed my grief. In fact, I was very practical and wrote a divorce agreement at, with my husband. I wrote it though. And so for that month, those months, I was just stoically me and uh, very cerebral and then the breast lump appeared and it was a cathartic moment for me to come to terms with the truth of it all and I became very interested and um, after that the, the day I think that I came back where they said after multiple mammograms and finally ultrasound because the doctor had seen it they really went over and over where is that lump it was walnut sized I, I was um, marveling and wondering at the mystery of it all and uh, Reverend Kathy called me and said, hi, she was from Mississippi, Rebecca. And I'd never actually really talked to her. I just received communion at the altar from her. She said, but I knew she was actually, the, uh, she led the healing uh, service on Wednesdays. She said, you've been on my heart like quiet on rice. <laughs> and I explained what had happened. And she said, oh, I just know you have to go to this conference. I've got a pamphlet on my desk. And it the, was the first a conference on prayer and spiritual healing in, in any medical school in the country. And it was at UNM. And it had Larry Dossie and all these, his wife, Barbara Dossie, who'd written a book on Florence Nightingale and the uh, Dean Emeritus from Princeton University that had done research studies on non-local intention and machines. And it was just this big academic help, uh, medical school conference. And she said, you have to go. And so I said, well, I can't afford it. And she said, I have discretionary money. And so I ended up going, even though it was full up, I had done so many major conferences in my life up until that point, international level, you know, cabinet level conferences by by national i knew how to get into a conference how you just slip in and i went and i just was exposed to something i had never heard in church and so it was very interesting to me that without any anyone knowing this that the holy spirit then tapped some people at saint mark's who said rebecca hampill who didn't you know at the time banister didn't do join up on hardly anything i mean i i, do, I didn't have time i was a working mom single mom at the time by then 
needs to be on the on the launch team for Hope in the Desert. And at my very first launch team meeting, Grace Royball, who is currently still the head of our healing ministry, but was at the time establishing a foundation of intercessory prayer for the launching of this church, said, there's someone here in the room who's called to help me in praying and also to help with the healing ministry. And I had just in the you know in the months since the conference just delved into deep reading about prayer and healing from the secular side um, and wondering why you never heard about it in church and so since then that's since 1999 i've been involved in that ministry but i was working and raising a kid and so what happened was um through the music i ended up meeting my husband who was a physician who was also interested in palliative care and i had this call to volunteer for hospice. And so I was doing that and also being part of the launch team of this mission church that was meeting way away from where I lived. And um, I've, I was beginning to feel a call to, I mean, I was definitely in ministry, no doubt about it. And the, but, but being the daughter of a Stanford professor and a academic intellectual mother, very secular, um, not baptized, Intentionally, they thought eventually, if our children want to be baptized, they can decide. Um, but my dad had been raised Plymouth Brethren. So the point is that I had some, some faith grounding with occasional church services and some people on, in the family line that were obviously praying for me. And um, I had gotten baptized with my son in, in Washington, D.C., um, It'll be 28 years uh, ago, just last May 22nd, just a few weeks ago. And so I arrive in, in Albuquerque and I'm launched off in the first few years into all this. And um, once I got, uh, got together with David and we, we, we got married, he kept saying, he kept getting this nudge, you, you need to go to seminary. You are called to ministry and I felt this calling to chaplaincy work because in healing prayer that's not chaplaincy that's definitely a ministry and yet there's so much of a quality of listening to both the spirit and the person as your husband's I see as a chaplain from your website so yeah so anyway um I had a little kid though I mean well by that time he was a teenager and um in school here and there were no seminaries in the state and so I ended up uh, just, we were looking online for the ones where you could go and spend a few weeks, you know, take online cl your online classes. And um, then um, one day while doing the um, Taze service, uh, which we were sponsoring in once a month and have been doing now for all the whole time since, since Hope launched, we had a monthly healing service from the inception. And uh, one of the gals who sang with us, I was driving her, you know, giving her a ride up to the, to the service. And she said, well, what about the Norbertines? What about St. Norbert's? And I, we've been on intercessory prayer group retreats there. Um, I loved the place. I had no idea that they had a master's in theological studies happening there and that it was a satellite of St. Norbert College in De Pere, Wisconsin. But I learned that. And when I was learning it, I, I discovered that the recently stepped down director was Kay Huggins. She had been the director of that program, the Masters in Theological Studies program. It was an outgrowth of the Ecumenical Institute for Ministry, which was a deeply affiliated with the New Mexico Council of Churches because of Wally Ford, may rest in peace, um, who launched that and had this big commitment to global ecumenism. And, uh, and that really resonated with me because I, I really wanted um, an ecumenical theological education in order to work in healthcare chaplaincy. Um, because I was going into the hospital at UNM playing cello, always accompanied with either a poet or an artist. We always went in in teams and it was for staff as well as patients. And I ended up, I would play at the chemo infusion center. So all that stuff came in. Of course, I'm going deep in my faith walk and uh, prayer helps draw you to the right books and things like that. But eventually I ended up going then down to the Norbertines and it, um, I thought this is perfect for me. 
I looked at the requirements and they were rigorous enough that I, who had already gone to UC Berkeley and then had a master's from Brown University in political science and big career in international trade at the state and federal level, I really wanted rigor and I wanted this, de you know, this ecumenical approach, but I wanted it to be Christian and I really needed to ground myself. I was being mentored by the head of the uh, only level one trauma hospital in our state, UNM Hospital. He, I had gone over to him from, from the university office where I worked and talked to him in my early you know, inklings of calling to this. And he's the one who said, you need to be, you need a degree. You need to ground yourself so deeply in where you stand with God and Christ, so that what you see here, it's not that, you know, you're right. It's, you never proselytize in this job, but you have to know that you know that you know as you witness what happens. And so he gave me this great, he said, just like any, any doctor needs a grounding in biology and chemistry and all those things, before even going to med school, you need that. And so that's what launched me into looking for the degree program, frankly. So I ended up taking in the program at uh, the St. Norbert College satellite program, which was staffed and faculty by EIM members. Um, I took the very first class I took was Kate at K's, and I told you about that. And she, she called it preaching and the art of communication it was the perfect beginning. And then took moral theology and Christian ethics um, with Presbyterian Frank Yates and uh, Episcopalian moving towards Catholicism, Lynn Bridges. And then I took theology and the practice of pastoral care from Bert Scott, another Presbyterian who had uh, done his CPE, one CPE, when he was getting going through seminary many years before. And then I took uh, Introduction to Spanish Mysticism and Christology from Kay Huggins again, and then the nature and mission of the church with Wally Ford and uh, Catholic priest, Charles Brown, uh, a diocesan priest at the time, um, local. Then the scripture and biblical interpretation from Judith Todd, another Presbyterian. Um, history of Christian spirituality, uh, another Presbyterian pastor, Ken, Ken Cuthbertson. Um, and systematic theology then with Howard Ebert, who is the chairman of the Masters of Theology program in De Pere and flies down here to teach systematics and a couple of other things and is over this program locally. And then historical development of Christian tradition with Ken Cuthbertson. And then I supplemented, I had to take prerequisites to get into the program. So I took two classes at UNM, uh, Old Testament, the, um, and uh, the Gospels with Judith Todd and Frank Gates, who were still part of the EIM, and I took their classes at, at UNM, and that's what permitted me to come in into the program without having had, had previous training in that. So, the, and then I also took a class on uh, the World Council of Churches and Ecumenism later, and how to support ecumenism in your church community and beyond. And uh, uh, the other class I took. I took one on spirituality um, from her and several others through EIM. I'm telling you that because there's the master's in theological studies, which is rich. And I feel, well, I've said this, I'll say this whenever I go to the New Mexico Council of Churches, they periodically, Kay used to ask me to come and speak about what was happening over at the Norbertine Abbey and what happens through EIM. I went to UC Berkeley and I went to Brown University for my other degrees. And this was the best teaching I've ever experienced. It was rigorous. It was, the program was more rigorous than you had a thesis and you had comps. Um, and it was good for me. I loved it. I, my husband at the time gave me the, you know, I was able then to stop work. And I just went deep and I went fast through this. Most people take five years because it's, it's for professionals who work. So the classes are Friday nights, Saturday, Friday nights and Saturdays, sometimes a Tuesday night in there, but it was designed also for a lot of Catholic deacons in this diocese are encouraged to go there and to, to deepen their, you know, their education. And so it was designed for those of us who had busy lives and families and, and other jobs, but my husband paid for it and I, I did it in three and a half years. 
And during that three and a half years, in the last year and a half, I, Dave Hartenberger, who was a Lutheran pastoral counselor, who gave, he did an extended CPE unit at the university, but it was not accredited by, by ACPE because University Hospital was not ready to go through that whole rigmarole. And they gave him permission to have a few of us. And I was in his last class, there were three of us, uh, to do, to be on the floors doing the work. And we did the verbatims and we did, he set it up so that we would be eligible for uh, board certification. So I did a year and a half in the, in the level one trauma hospital. Interestingly enough, at that time, the only other program that had been in the state for chaplain training had been at Presbyterian, but in that time, they didn't have it. It was gone. So it was ideal. I didn't feel like I was shunning this, the normal way. It was God, a God thing. So I did that while I was doing my, my uh, degree. And the day after I finished my degree, uh, my master's in theological studies, and I was uh, one of the, uh, what do you call it? I gave the, the talk on behalf of the students. Um, uh, the next day I started though at Presbyterian, they'd started it up with a new director and a new, uh, a new uh, supervisor of clinical pastoral education. And we were the first class uh, for a full year residency. So I, I dived deep into that. I was assigned to the critical care floor and, and, and uh, uh, cardiac critical care and lungs. And then I also was assigned to be the designated chaplain for their palliative care specialty in the hospital as, as a pilot project to see about maybe having a designated. And because of that, then I took two additional courses through the Spiritual Care Association Healthcare Chaplaincy Network, which would partnered with Cal State, um, where was it? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, it has a, a, a palliative care institute. And so together, healthcare chaplaincy in Manhattan and they put together a introduction to spiritual care in palliative care. And then they did an advanced one the next. So I did the first one and then six months later, they, they used us as the guinea pigs for the advanced one. So I'm certified in palliative care. All this to say that in, in spirituality and palliative care, that the grounding that I got down at the Abbey in its splendid, have you gone and played in their library? Isn't it the best? And their chapel, and it's just scrumptious. Oh, and you're muted, so I can't hear you because you're recording. Okay. So anyway, that is that is what I've done there. And um, since then, of course, I've taught uh, based with a lot of this stuff. Uh, then I've now taught didactics for um, chaplaincy training. My, my former supervisors asked me to teach a few times. And of course, now I teach at the School for Healing Prayer that we offer, which is, um, we are blessed and sponsored by Christian Healing Ministries in Florida, which was Francis and Judith McNutts. You may have heard of them. They have a very reasonable, deep, accountable, genuinely good, uh, way of teaching about healing prayer and the history of it and and then they have modules and they have four levels and so hope in the desert we've been offering that to the broader community in this area and we've had people come from out of state for that and I'm on the teaching team now for that so I've taught on you know grief and currently teaching on Oh, being with the dying and how to pray with them. And the whole module, the whole approach to Christian healing ministry is very humble, very spirit led. Listen, love, and pray. We are not the experts. <laughs> we are not teaching theology. We are not. So it's, it's very grounded. And that's why I think Father Dan and our previous, you know, rectors have been supportive of it is it's so balanced and he you know he oversees it and so does Chloe Tischler, Reverend Chloe Tischler. We're now holding it down at Our Lady in the Valley because it has a better space. And so I'm you know she came out of Hope in the Desert. That was her 
her call came through our you know intercessory prayer and activities and then she got ordained and so there's this interesting sort of we now during all this as i was becoming a chaplain i did go um i was actually you know father dan was keeping uh the bishop at that time bono in informed of my progress and what i was doing and i was told that I it was time for me to do to go through the discernment process for holy orders. And this was during my CPE year, my residential year, residency year. And so they formed a committee and I'm an obedient, you know, the Episcopalian. And um, I knew from the outset that I was called to lay ministry. I mean, it was a very clear thing that I wrestled with through the MTS program and thought about. And because there were there were deacons, there were, you know, pastors in that class, there were wannabe pastors. It was, you know, and and I just I realized why I'd been called into the via media for one thing, the you know, the Anglican via media. I got it. I, I was really not that I'm wishy-washy, but it was very important that my credentials and my training and my understanding of the sacraments could go from absolute Protestantism to full-blown Roman Catholic. And similarly, as a woman, it was very important for me to be a lay minister, which I was experiencing in the hospital setting. I'd come in and the Calvary Chapel folks would see that the chaplain was a woman and there, you know, there's this crisis time. I'm on the, this is, you know, they're either in the ER, they're, you know, they're on the, in the ICU and they, and their first thing is, oh my gosh, here's, here's who the chaplain is and it's a woman. And I could see it and I could, you know, you could feel some of the family members bristle and I'd say, hi, I'm your chaplain. And then they'd say, you know, well, where are you a pastor? And I'd say, I'm not a pastor. I'm, I come alongside, I'm a professional healthcare worker here to care for your human spirit. That's what I'm trained in. And they would just relax because what they needed was the other thing. And similarly, go into a devout Roman Catholic as a woman, I'm not wearing a collar. And it's very important for them to have me not wear a collar or to, you know, if I'd come in as a nun, it would have been okay. And we had some nuns doing that, but you know, not with it now without a habit or without the you know from them they could accept me they could they could accept and forget me so that the holy spirit could come and so i knew this and i went through the entire discernment process and all my papers are there and i took the big you know the battery of psychological tests which here's a little piece to take back again to the diocese which i did say to bishop hun um <laughs> i said you know paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars for this process. And I never got my psych thing back. And I told them and I wanted it. And it was, it was never, I never got the anything, but I did it. And I, in the end, my, uh, my final essay and, I, um, and my interview with, with Bishop um, Bono was, I am called to this ministry and I need the Episcopal Church's blessing to do it. And that's why I'm here in obedience and gratitude for the process. It was a great process. I mean, I got confronted with, you know, I needed to explain myself about my openness to homosexuality and transgender um, and all that stuff and explain it in a scriptural Christian way where I'd come to from that in that position. All that was a fabulous experience to go through the Commission on Ministry. It was great. And the committee was great. And I loved doing it. And it was more than love. It was um, part of my formation, absolutely necessary. And there was no doubt in my mind that I was called to lay ministry. And it has been affirmed ever since. Trust the work. Trust the Trust the soul of God within Trust the work, trust the soul.